Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, sponsored by the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, uh, on how to apply for a high impact, innovative quality of life grant. I am Joey Wallace. I'm the director of the Resna Catalyst Project. And I would like to welcome everyone and uh, begin the webinar today. I, I want to make it clear and let everyone know that this webinar will be archived. And if you go to ChristopherReeve.org dash QOI, uh, you will find the archive. It should be posted by Wednesday. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, the grants that we will be speaking about today are, are intended to be competitive with individual awards uh, up to $75,000 in one-year grants. There is the potential to award grants up to five agencies across the country, uh, and these will be implementing state assistive technology programs that are funded under the Assistive Technology Act. The intent here of these grants is to uh, promote innovative one-time programs that target specific underserved populations that are within a broader disability community within your state. And there will be lots of uh, detail that we're going to be talking about and breaking this down uh, throughout the, the call. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tony Cahill. He's the director of the Center for Development and Disability, University of New Mexico School of Medicine. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Joey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're thrilled that so many of you are here. Um, this grant program is a new one. This is the first year, of course, that we're going to be doing it. We do have uh, plans to make this a, an annual award program uh, consistent with funding from our funder, which is the Administration on Community Living, the Department of Health and Human Services. And what we thought we'd do next is go through some of the key elements of the grant. Uh, we're going to ask that you hold your questions until the end, uh, and Donna Valente will be facilitating uh, questions and answers. Uh, so if you have a question that comes up in an early slide, you might want to uh, uh, write it down, and then we will try to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. What we're hoping is that we can go through some of the key parts of the grant here. So uh, first we'd like to talk just, uh, and Joey's already mentioned this, that uh, the, uh, this grant uh, program is open only to implementing agencies for the State Assistive Technology Program funded by the Assistive Technology Act. And uh, we only are uh, accepting one application per state, and it must be from the implementing agency. Um, as you know, we are the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, and our target population uh, consists of people who are paralyzed. And we have a very, very broad functional definition of paralysis, which you see here. Uh, paralysis is a condition that results in an inability or difficulty in moving the upper or lower extremities, the legs and or the arms. So this functional definition separates what paralysis is from the cause. So uh, spinal cord injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, MS, ALS, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, transverse myelitis. Uh, we, we do not focus on a particular medical condition or diagnosis for this grant program, but the target population that you all propose uh, in your applications, those of you who choose, uh, choose to write, needs to include people with paralysis in this very broad definition uh, and or family members and or caregivers. So, uh, so for example, uh, people with developmental disabilities alone is not an appropriate target audience for, for this particular grant program. But it could well include people with developmental disabilities uh, as long as 
the the folks people with paralysis are are included. Um, the whole purpose of this grant is to try to use assistive technology to increase access or inclusion for underserved populations. Now, people with disabilities, as you know, are themselves um, an underserved population. But for this uh, particular project, to this particular grant program, that's too broad. Uh, so we're not uh, allowing folks who just say, um, you know, people with disabilities. So here are some examples of traditionally uh, underserved populations. Uh, it could be people of color, could be ethnic minorities, people f uh, from low-income families or low-income areas of a state, uh, people whose English is limited, uh, people living in rural areas, and speaking as uh, from New Mexico, we're very familiar with this particular one here. Uh, LGBT populations, uh, older adults and caregivers, or families uh, who are coping with a newly acquired disability, someone whose disability has uh, uh, just recently been acquired. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the number of people that you want you you propose serving, and there is no upper or lower limit on the number of people uh, that you propose serving. But one of the things the review committee will be looking for is the feasibility of what you propose, given your budget. So if you identify an underserved population that has you know you estimate there are 40,000 people in it, and you think you're going to um, serve them all for $75,000, depending on what it is you propose, that may be problematic. Uh, by the same token, if you have, a, and I'm, I'm being a little silly here, but if you have, you know, you identify six people in a particular underserved population, that may end up being a little problematic as well. So we'll be looking at uh, the, the kind of feasibility of what you propose, given the resources and how you in, intend to use them. So we're going to look at specific, well-defined underserved populations within the broader disability community in your application. And we will be looking for a very specific kind of concrete uh, definition of a group of people. Uh, you can propose to increase access to services and or equipment. Uh, we expect uh, all the projects that we fund will result in increased independence or inclusion of people within the underserved population in their communities. And we are going to, for those of you who have taken a look at the, the RFP, uh, we are going to be looking at the impact, what you propose as the impact and how you intend to measure that impact. Uh, you can do one of two things. You, you, your AT program may have an existing program or service that focuses on one or more of these underserved populations. And you would like to use these funds to augment or expand the existing program to reach more of this. Or you can propose a new project or service uh, that, that your, your agency has not done before um, to start something new, to initiate a new program or service. Um, the, the top line in this slide says it all. Uh, the broad category of people with disabilities is not a sufficiently well-defined population for this grant. Uh, what we're asking you to do in the application is identify the population, uh, describe why it's underserved, uh, giving an estimate of the number of people within the specified population. Uh, but also, and this is very important, you may or may not choose to target all the people in this specified population in this grant program. And that links back to what I said before about looking at the feasibility of what is possible to do uh, given the grant funds that are available. So you could identify a, a, an estimate of a particular underserved population in your state, 
but say that we're going to focus on a smaller subset of these, and of course you'd have to give a justification for doing that. Uh, again, you know, age, geographic location, gender, type of disability, cultural or racial group, all of the things that uh, we talked about or I talked about uh, in a couple of slides ago uh, would be acceptable populations. Um, we can fund direct services. Uh, what we can't fund, we cannot fund food. Uh, so if food or beverages are part of your grant and you're going to need to get that from uh, another place because we're just not allowed uh, to, to, to subsidize uh, food costs. And so we, we ask that you not include that. Um, we can't fund direct grants to individuals. So an example of this would be, you know, we're going to identify these, uh, uh, you know, 50 people and we're going to give them each a check for $1,000 to do something like that. Um, our funding restrictions don't allow us to give out money like that. We can't fund construction, uh, new construction. Um, and for the purposes of this grant program, uh, indirect costs or sometimes called overhead costs or F&A costs, facility and administrative costs, are not allowable. Other than these four things, uh, we can fund pretty much anything else. So let's talk a little bit about an important part of the grant program. Uh, we are insisting that funded applications uh, include other organizations in your state, uh, disability organizations or others, who are, will take an active role in some part of the project. Um, they are not required to commit funds but uh, there must be a direct commitment from them to uh, participate in some way in the project. So, for example, an agency might say, well, we will take the lead in hosting uh, regional meetings or, you know, we will work with you uh, to set up um, the services in this particular part of the state. And what we would like to ask you is that for each uh, organization that agrees to partner with you, uh, they will write a letter which you would s submit with your application uh, that you will include in the application. And in the RFP itself, we give examples of some of the organizations, um, whether it be a Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, a city or state commission or council on disability, um, the, the University Center for Excellence in your state, um, a, you know, a governor's commission, uh, a protection and advocacy organization. We, the examples that we give in the RFP are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I want to just make sure that the, there's a distinction between the, your collaborating partners and broad levels of support. Um, you know, we welcome general letters of support saying um, that, you know, they support this work and it's important and, and you know, they very much would like the opportunity uh, for you to get the grant. But those are not letters of commitment or collaboration. Um, these letters need to contain concrete specific actions that people, uh, these organizations will take to help you further the goals of your grant. Um, one of the thing, parts of the application that you're going to, to need to f fill out is you're going to need to describe how you will measure and document the success of your project. Um, we do have some, uh, a, a, a document posted on the website uh, called a Quick Guide to Establishing Evaluation Indicators. And we do expect as part of the, the proposal an evaluation plan, uh, what actual indicators you will use uh, that and can be a combination of, of output and impact measures. So uh, as I think probably most of you are aware of, uh, output measures are simply counting. You know, we are going to train so many people. We are going to provide uh, this piece of equipment to so many people. 
they are literally count, uh, counting the things. Uh, they're what are called volume of service. But the difference between an output and an impact indicator is that you may well say, well, we're going to train so many people. That's an output measure indicator. The impact indicator describes what they learned, what impact the training had on their knowledge or their future behavior. And impact indicators are typically always changes in knowledge, attitude, or behavior. So people will do things differently. So the clients in your program may get it out into the community more uh, and be more inclusive. So the Quick Guide to Evaluation Indicators outlines this in more detail. Um, and then we also ask in the evaluation plan that you describe the evaluation methods you'll use. Are there going to be surveys or interviews, focus groups, review of program documents? Um, again, we are not expecting the grantees to be experts in evaluation. We are not expecting grantees to necessarily uh, hire an outside person to conduct the evaluation, although that is an option if you would like, but it, I, I stress it's an option. Uh, but we do need to know in the application uh, who, will, um, who will conduct the evaluation, as well as a brief statement of their expertise and skill in, in conducting evaluations. So during the, the reporting year, we plan on, on uh, awarding the first grants in January. Uh, the Internal Review Committee is now scheduled to meet um, the, the first full week of January. And there will be an interim progress report uh, due about halfway through the grant year. And we will be setting out uh, um, requirements for that report. We're going to try to make it fairly short. Uh, fairly sweet. What we're going to be looking in the mid-year report is based on your original proposal, what parts are working well, what challenges have you faced, and what are you doing to overcome the challenges, and is there anything we can do to assist you in overcoming those challenges. Uh, then the final report will be due no later than two months after completion of the one-year grant. So we do uh, plan on having these grants go from January to January. So the application opened early in October. Today we're having the webinar. Uh, your applications are due in a relatively short period of time, November 11th. We will then be uh, reviewing, the, we have an external review committee and an internal review committee, uh, which will be uh, reviewing the proposals. We will be, the internal review committee will be meeting uh, the week of January 6th. And then on the 16th of January, we'll be announcing the, the, the winners, or the, 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 the successful grant applications. And one of the nice things about uh, this grant program is uh, for the funded uh, uh, proposals, we'll be sending you a check. So your interim report is due on July 31st, and your final um, report will be due no later than March 16th, 2017. So now I'm going to hand this over uh, to Donna Valente, who's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the mechanics of applying for the grant. So Donna, back to you. Okay, thank you so much. So everything about this grant is done online. So you'll want to go to www.christopherreeve.org, and then you'll want to look to the left drop-down menu and click on Quality of Life Grants. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. On the left-hand side, you'll see the landing page for the Christopher Reeve Foundation website. So if you look at the left-hand column, and you'll want to go down four items and you'll see Quality of Life Grants. So you click on that. And then on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see what the Quality of Life Grants program landing page looks like. So you can get a lot of information about the program overall. But to get to this grant program, you'll want to click on the big red Apply Here button. And that will bring you to our Quality of Life Grants page. And then to access the, the high in, the impact 
grant, the Innovative Assistive Technology Grant, you'll want to look to the left-hand column, and you will find it listed about halfway down where that arrow shows. And we have it a little bit hidden as it's not open to everyone. It's open to uh, the, the people on this call today. So uh, we don't have it extremely visible uh, because we want to make sure that the people that are qualified and eligible are the ones that will, will find it and apply. So you'll want to click on to the High Impact Innovative Assistive Technology Grant link. And that will bring you to the page for the program. And the information summary about the program will be there, uh, taken from the RFP and the application. So at the bottom of that page, you'll see in red, we have five documents that you can download. And we created all of these supporting materials for you to help make your application as strong as it can be. So you'll see a list of the application questions. We have a people first language guide, which is very helpful. We have the quick guide to establishing evaluation indicators that Tony talked about. We have the reviewer criteria uh, that we want you to see. That's what our reviewers will be looking at when they look at all the grants and score them. And uh, the list of questions. So now when you go to click on the actual online application, you'll go down to the link that's showing. And that's our application vendor link. You'll click on that, and you'll get your login page. So you want to put in your email address. And then you'll want to go underneath where it says forgot your password. Since we haven't created it yet, you want to click on create new account. And then on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see all the information that's needed to start an account for your agency. And then once you've done that, you'll create a password uh, for, that you will use. You create it. And then you will be able to enter the application. In the top right, you'll see an access code. And that's where you'll enter HI2015. And that's the access code to get into this restricted grant program. And then the information that you had input to start your account will be moved over into your application. And then you begin the application. And we have also within the online application, we have several spots where you can access those documents that we talked about before as well as the template for the project budget. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see how it's set up so that you can upload your letters of support and your general letters of support, uh, the collaborative letters as well as the general letters of support. And the, since you can only use each upload button for one upload, if you have more than one, please scan them into one document and then upload that document. And you'll, you should be fine. We also ask if you can upload an organizational chart if you have that available. But we do not require that you submit formal resumes or CVs for project personnel. And this slide shows where the budget information is found. About uh, two-thirds of the way down, you'll see information about the budget. In blue, you'll see where you can download the budget worksheet template. So you'll complete that. It's a very general, standard budget template. It's an Excel document. So you will fill that out. And then underneath that, you'll find where you will upload the completed budget. And then we also have an upload button if you'd like to submit a vendor quote, if that's applicable to your project. And then when you're all finished, everything's uploaded, you can hit Submit. You can also save your application and come back to it. You don't have to do it all in one shot. If you do that and you come back to it, 
you enter the same way that you went in to, to start your account and create your password, you'll just be a returning um, applicant. And then when you go back to it, you go in through that same link and you'll be able to get back into your application and continue. When you're all done, you'll click that Submit Application button at the bottom, bottom of the page and that will go in directly to us and you'll get an email back saying that it was submitted. And that's it for the mechanics. So we can open it up to your questions. At this time, if you would like to ask an audio question, please press star 1. Again, that's star 1 to ask an audio question. We'll give a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And at this time, there are no audio questions. Well, do we want to take um, some of the questions that have been submitted on the chat? I'm sorry, Mr. Tony, we do have a question. All right. Caller, please state your first and last name, please. Your line is open. Okay, Jim McCarthy. Um, so each agency submits one, one project. I assume that means that that project can't be two proposals. In other words, the proposal has to be logical as a kind of complete project. You can't t just take the time and, and propose two different projects with all the information in the one in one proposal. They have to be logic it has to be logically connected. Uh, y yes, uh, in the sense of I mean I, I I hesitate this is Tony Cahill by the way, I'm sorry. Um, I hesitate to to answer totally definitively because I can I, I could see in theory uh, a, a project or a proposal that says, look, we want to engage in two complementary sets of activities around one broader um, you know one broader goal. I, I think if it were two totally disconnected things, you know, we want to do this over here, and then we want to do something totally different. Uh, I'm not sure that would be appropriate for the grant program. Okay. But well, I, so I, complementary I, activities would be somehow we say the goal would, might be if it were if they were complementary, we want that we want to provide services that will help the targeted population leave their home, and there may be two very different sites, but that's the end point that the people selected will have greater access out of home into community maybe. Yeah, no, I don't think it's that close. I don't think it would be that close. Like I think that might, I could see that being, I don't think it would be that close. Yeah, and I think what we want to run the risk, we, we want to try to avoid the risk here of um, d diluting resources so much that, that neither project might be successful. In, in the sense of, you know, if you have got two totally discrete and separate projects, um, each of which requires some, you know, uh, administrative costs and so on and so forth, it, it might run the risk of diluting it. But again, I would say that if you have a two-pronged approach, and I'm sorry to be so vague, but, you know, without knowing specifics, it's, uh, uh, it's hard to be specific. Um, you know, if you've got a twi kind of two-pronged approach to accomplish something, then I think we would definitely consider that. And so, okay, that helps. Um, okay. In your in your diminished resources, does that suggest that grantees? I don't that grantees should build toward expending something close to the seventy. I, I mean, a project that rightly spends somewhere toward the top of the grant award? Well, you know, we had the, the maximum In other words, you could do a $30,000 project or you could do the same project and serve more people and it'd be a $60,000 project. Should Correct. you do the $60,000 project? Uh, I can only give you a personal answer. 
Um, if, if I were applying, and of course I won't be, because we're not a state TAP program, uh, I would try to maximize and leverage the resources available to you in this grant program. Um, now I can see somebody uh, submitting a, a kind of a pilot project where they are not quite certain that they want to, you know, do a, 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 a much bigger implementation. But I think, you know, you've got an opportunity here for up to $75,000. Um, I think you should use as much of it as, as you think you need to accomplish what you set out. I mean, one of the things we'll be looking for are, are disconnects. You know, we'll be looking for uh, $400,000 projects that are funded at 60, you know. Uh, and I think that's that's always an issue, right? But other than that, no, not at all, not at all. Are there other audio questions, or should we go through some of the questions on the uh, that have been answered on the or being asked on the chat line? At this time, ladies and gentlemen, again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. Again, that's star one to ask an audio question. And there are no audio questions at this time. All right. Well, uh, Joey, Donna, uh, Julie, what I think we ought to do, if it's all right with you, is just go through the uh, the questions that are on the um, on the chat board. Is that all right? Sounds good. Sounds good. Yes. So the first one is that uh, this particular program is within a USED, which is in turn within Temple. Uh, do you want a table of organization for the AT Act program, the USED or the university? Great question. Um, I, I think the, you should indicate that you are within the USED at Temple, but really give us an organizational chart for the actual Act program. All right? So that's that. Next question, can ramps be considered for the grant or are these considered construction? No ramps are not considered construction. Um, construction means building a new building, uh, things like that. But uh, any accessible modifications uh, are, are definitely allowed. Uh, Misty asked, is travel for staff allowable? Yes, it is. Um, you know, travel needs to be reasonable. Um, and for those of you who are with state agencies, needs to be within your state's regulations on per diem, uh, lodging and so on, but definitely, uh, and certainly from in a state like New Mexico, uh, where it's so big and so rural, we travel a lot. So yes, staff, is allow uh, staff travel is allowable. Uh, portion of salary, is a portion of salary to manage and implement the project allowable? Uh, yes, uh, commensurate with, with uh, uh, what you are proposing, it's probably going to take people. Uh, as it says in the RFP, we are looking uh, at staff in terms of direct service uh, staff money. Um, and uh, we, we look at that more favorably, but absolutely, um, it would be um, very appropriate to put in appropriate staff. Uh, Alma Burgess, is there a minimum number of collaborative letters required? No. Uh, more is not better. Um, in other words, we're not going to be sitting there with a scorecard score saying, oh, you have, uh, um, he has 18 and this one only has nine. The letters of collaboration should be appropriate to what it is you're proposing and the substantive project that you're proposing. Um, and, and that will look very different. So there is no minimum number, there is no maximum number. Uh, Janet Morris says, can you talk a little bit more in regards to underserved populations? Are they limited to the list or can they be outside of the list? Uh, absolutely, it can be outside the list. Those are uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, we certainly would like, if appropriate, those to be included. But every state is different. Every state has different kinds of underserved populations. And uh, all that we ask as we talked about in the webinar, is that you uh, document and explain why this is an underserved uh, population. Uh, let's see here. When you 
we asked for a website that would be more meaningful to provide our programs rather than universities. Yes, we would like to see your website, um, very definitely. Uh, if you want us to look, you tell us what you want us to look at, okay? Uh, if, if, going back to the example before, uh, where an AT program within a university center of excellence, or you said, uh, if, it, if we would certainly want to see the AT program website, but if you would like us for some reason to look at the USED's website, because there's a reason to, tell us to do so in the application. Tell us why you want us to look at it and give us uh, the URL. Um, if we apply for the full amount, is there a possibility you might come back and say, we like it, but we'll fund it for less? Um, a very slight possibility. We intend to look at the costs and uh, we do have funds available for up to five grants of $75,000. Um, if we uh, have questions about the relevance or the appropriateness of a particular funding um, line item within your budget, if, if we find the proposal acceptable and would like to fund it, but have a, a question about one or more line items, we'll come back to you uh, Donna will come back to you, um, talk with you about it, and ask for some more justification. Um, so, you know, that uh, uh, we're not going to come back and just unilaterally cut funds from you. Laurie, yes, the money does need to be spent in one year. Uh, these are one year grant programs. Um, we know that. Uh, uh, that may cause, you know, that limits in some ways what you can do. A year in some ways is a very long time, but a year in other ways is an instance, and we know that. Um, but yes, we, we need the money uh, spent within a year. If for some reason you have a delay uh, and, and you, you need to uh, or would like to have a carry forward for a short period of time, that's something you'll need to speak with Donna about as soon as you know uh, that that will happen. Uh, and it's not automatically granted, uh, but we will at least consider, uh, Donna will consider uh, uh, that you know, based on a case-by-case -case basis if it occurs. And Sandra, no, there is no page limit. Um, take as long as, as you need to say what you need to say, um, but don't go overboard, uh, you know, in the sense of, it, write what you need to write, and that's what we'll, we'll look at. Well, those were the questions that were on the chat function. Does anybody have any more? There's and actually, we'll there's actually two more questions that are up a little bit higher. Um, oh, I'm Karen, sorry. That's, that's okay. Um, Karen asked about um, the fact that you mentioned that grant money cannot be given to participants. Could equipment be given? And the answer to that is yes. And Julie asked, um, she said, two weeks to put together a grant application of excellence and gather letters of collaboration is extremely difficult. Is there any way to extend the deadline a couple of weeks? And I think that um, since this is the first time we're doing this, I would say yes. I would like to extend it to November 30th, which is um, two weeks, two and a half weeks after the 11th. It's a Monday. So hopefully that will give everybody a bit more comfort level in getting the materials ready. And one more thing on the, the um, page limits. When you do see a character limit, that does include spaces and characters. But if you feel that you need that adjusted, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll work it out for you. Okay, and I saw, just saw another question from uh, Jamie. Um, the program will be run through an existing program, so can funds be used to update existing database software to accommodate? Uh, without knowing the specifics, it's hard to give a definitive answer. But um, y yes, uh, updating existing database software is, is potentially a, 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 a very appropriate expense depending on what the nature of your proposal is. So the answer to that is, is potentially yes, and I'm sorry to be so 
uh, um, so vague about it. But again, it depends so much on what specifically you're proposing. And then, Allison, your, to your question, can money be given to collaborating entities for their help and services? Absolutely. Uh, it, it, you have the effect of subawards if you would like to do that. Um, that that would be fine. And and I guess on behalf of Donna and and Joey and myself, you're welcome, Misty, for the extension. Uh, although we'll need to get the word out, Donna, to everybody, yes. including those who weren't on the call today. We'll do that. Joey, any any last thoughts from you? Uh, no, I know. I think we've. Go ahead. Excuse the interruption. You do have a question. Call it, please. State your first and last name. Your line is open. It's Jim McCarthy again. Um, transportation for program participants, I assume, is fine. Um, some of the transportation could be rather expensive with, with paratransit, et cetera, but I assume that's fine if that seems the best way to get people to services. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, I know that uh, uh, we would all like to thank Joey uh, Wallace uh, for his help and assistance. Uh, when we first thought of this, this idea, Joey was the very first person we contacted. Um, we had worked with him before at the Southwest Conference on Disability and others. Um, and Joey is serving in the role of, of technical assistance, uh, providing us with information about the AT program and, and your particular programs. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that Joey will, uh, by his own request or at his own request, uh, Joey will not be a, a voting member of the review committee, uh, although he will be there to give the review committee technical assistance and guidance uh, on different parts of your, your, your applications. Uh, but his um, um, his role here is, is really helping us shape this grant program. He was centrally involved in helping us craft it and write it and reviewing the different uh, components of it because uh, he probably better than anyone has a feel for all your different programs. And he will be available uh, not only during the review process but during the grant year to, to help uh, with that. Uh, the per yes, Melinda, the person to call would, would be Donna Valente. Um, and if it's not a question she can answer, the, the question was, is there someone specific we can call to discuss our proposal before we submit it to make sure we're on the right track? And D Donna would be the, uh, the, the, the first person to call. If uh, she feels she would like to bring either Joey in uh, or, or me or others, she will do so. But uh, Donna is the, is the manager of this program. So uh, it would be important that all your questions and comments should go to her, and then she can farm them out uh, as she need be. The only caveat uh, is, is, of course, neither Donna nor Joey nor I can say, oh my God, that's a great idea. I'm sure you're going to get funded. I mean, we can help you uh, find out if, if you know, the, your, your plan proposal meets the, um, uh, you know, the, the broad requirements of the grant, but we can't make specific substantive comments about the, the quality of your idea. That would be unfair, of course, to everybody. And the last question I see here, address the sustainability component post the grant period. Uh, Janice and others, this is always a tough one, and we know this. Um, we are in the position of having to do the same thing on, on occasion. Um, sustainability is a tough one. I think the best way to phrase it is this way. We are hoping that for each of the funded projects, that at the end of the 12-month period, uh, when the money has been completed, is that there will be a way to not just have the program end. So uh, again, I'm being um, you know, kind of hypothetical here, but if you're going to be buying, or use the example before, you're going to be bringing people in for service and you're going to be using grant funds to do that. Um, it, it may be the case that you will not have the level of funding 
uh, that you had during the grant period to continue that. But is, can you describe in what ways uh, you are going to not just have the program stop and, and not just have the program um, end entirely uh, at the end of the grant period? Uh, what we are not asking to do, and I think this is very important, uh, we are not asking you to say, oh, we are going to find another 75,000 um, to, to continue this at exactly the same level. Now, if you can, that's great, uh, but we're not expecting that. What we are expecting in sustainability is to try to give us some indication of how you might be able to keep some elements of the program uh, running. Um, Janice, I hope that, that, that helps a little bit. And Mr. Tony, pardon the interruption, you do have another audio question. Caller, please state your first and last name. Your line is open. Uh, this is Kathy McAdam. If we're working with groups across disabilities um, that include the target group for your grant, um, does that present a problem if it's a mixture of of um, participants receiving services? No. Donna, uh, do you, you concur in that? Yeah, I do. As long as, as the target population will clearly benefit from the program. Okay. And I think that's the end of the audio questions. All right. Well, I think if you have additional questions, and Donna, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think having a mind like a sieve these days, that if you have additional questions, you should send them to uh, Donna Valente uh, at, uh, at her email address at the, the, the foundation, uh, dvalente at christopherreeve.org. She will answer them, but then make sure that the answers go out to everybody, uh -huh. so every, everybody's on a level playing field. Absolutely. Um, so this is not your last opportunity to ask questions, but it would be most helpful if you could submit them to Donna by email, and then when she uh, routes you an answer, she will make sure that uh, everybody from the AT programs, including those who were on, um, is, is copied on the, on the response. I'll create a, a questions document with all the questions and answers and send that out too. Perfect. And would you guys like to conclude today's conference call? Well, yes, this is Joey. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time today and um, uh, asking these wonderful questions. We covered a lot of ground in almost an hour. Uh, and I'm sure we fully expect some exciting and creative uh, applications to come in. And once again, any way uh, that we can be of assistance Please don't have it, hesitate, and I know that you won't. This does conclude today's webinar. You may now disconnect.